we live in a society today, uh, and unfortunately, even sometimes in the church, uh, where unfaithfulness is just look, looked at as covenant breaking. Um, but it's much more serious than that. It is way more serious than that. Um, so I hope and pray uh, that we can really, and if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, uh, I really want us, you know how I am, I'm very thorough in making sure that we get an understanding for ourselves. Uh, so please, uh, even if you feel like, okay, well, you know, this is kind of intimate, I don't really want to share this in front of the whole class, then see me separately. Uh, but I, what I don't want is for anyone to go through this lesson having any questions, having any, um, needing any clarity about anything um, that you, that we can really grasp from God's word, okay? Is that all right? Y'all okay this morning? Okay, y'all missing that coffee from last week, ain't you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right, so we're uh, on your handouts. Uh, let's look at the foundation. Okay, the foundation, again, uh, comes from the book of Malachi, chapter 2, and I pray that you have your Bibles open to Malachi, chapter 2, uh, and in particular, verses 13 through 16. And note that this section of the book of Malachi um, the most uh, serious and sinful nature of the breaking of God's covenant. Uh, in this day, uh, both the priests and people were guilty of sinfully disregarding the word of God, okay? And living in direct opposition to his will and holy commandments. Irreverence towards the Lord God was so widely or so widespread and influenced throughout God's people that they had seemingly uh, lost all regard uh, for every relevant covenant relationship that mattered. In fact, number one, notice, they had no respect for the Lord God himself, Malachi 1.6. And honestly, when we have no respect for the Lord God himself, we can just stop right there. Because if we don't have respect for him, we won't have respect unto anything else. Okay? So they had no respect uh, for the Lord God himself, Malachi 1.6. Uh, number two, they had no respect for the sacredness of his worship, Malachi 1, 7 through 14. They had no respect for the interpersonal relationships with their Israelite brethren, Malachi 2, and verse 10. Okay. And they had no respect uh, for the distinctiveness of being God's own people, okay? Being God's own holy people, Malachi 2, 11 and 12. But then finally, we see number five, uh, they had no respect for the covenant of marriage, okay? Malachi 2, 13 through 16. But I really want to point out, before we get into it, I really want to point out um, because sometimes we don't look uh, at our relationship with one another as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, nor did they then, as God's people, uh, they don't look at, sometimes we don't look at that as the fact that we're in a covenant relationship together. As brothers and sisters in Christ, having one father, being one people, we have a relationship one with another. Amen, somebody. And in that relationship one with another, 
Uh, we have responsibilities. We have uh, duties uh, that we're obligated one to another. And the obligation is not just simply out of duty. The obligation needs to be prompted out of love. Love for God, love for one another. Amen, somebody. Amen. And then, uh, number four, I find uh, very uh, important as well because uh, at that time, they failed to uphold uh, the distinctiveness of being God's holy people. Um, they, instead of maintaining and upholding that standard, that distinctiveness as being God's people, they allowed themselves to marry foreign women, which in turn, um, I'm looking for a word, it, it diluted, if you will, if y'all understand that. It diluted their distinctiveness, okay? So the same thing uh, that happened then is happening today. The church, in many ways, whether we are aware of it or not, uh, whether we are uh, abreast or uh, aware of what's going on in the brotherhood, the church is, is somewhat losing its distinctiveness as God's holy people, all right? And I'm telling you, that's not by accident, okay? That's not by accident. Some people are all intentionally uh, disassociating themselves as being the church of Christ, uh, in order to uh, be more widely accepted in other groups, uh, so forth and so on. Um, but this, this is uh, an issue because God uh, sent his son, his son gave his life, and his son gave his life uh, for his church. And that church has a distinctive nature a distinctive nature that cannot be um, changed, uh, cannot be compromised, okay? Any questions, any feedback on that thus far? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I, I went to Chicago a few weeks ago and I went to um, serve, I'm sorry, I went to worship at the church that I grew up in, that I was baptized in, mm -hmm. baptized at, and they had moved locations. And <clears throat> years ago, I don't know if any of you have heard of Brother Robert M. Woods. He's, he was a very dynamic minister. And it was such a spiritual um, upbringing, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it. But when I went to visit this church, it had changed. I was like shocked. They had the social hour, you know, of coffee and donuts, not like what we had last week, not like that. This is something that they have every week. It's like um, when worship service should be started. And so it made me think, using your word, how diluted the church is becoming. It's getting, it seems like the churches of Christ are getting a little bit closer to the worldly churches. And, and they're pulling away from, from sticking with God's word. And it's very, it was very disheartening for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to say. All right. Are y'all getting that? And, and the truth of the matter is um, we, we should not be surprised because the Bible already tells us that. And I always think back to what our Lord said. He told his disciples, he said, fear not, notice this, fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. Are y'all getting anything from that? Little flock? Matthew 7, he said, few there be. When you and I, amen somebody, 
when you and I hold fast to the pattern of sound words, when we hold fast to the truth, it's going to be a lonely road. But that's okay. you got to have to be okay with that. Okay? And we're not here to try and appease people. We don't draw people. God does through his word. So if we have to do gimmicks and we have to do all these worldly things in order to draw people, that's not way that God's way of drawing. And we don't have permission to do that. All right? Doesn't mean we can't do good works. Doesn't mean that we can't be creative within the liberties that God has given us. But never compromising the pattern. Never trying to, as Israel did, give us kings like other nations. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, and to support that, uh, the scripture that we're familiar with is in 2 Timothy 3, where it says in 3.13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Mm -hmm. But 14 is key. But continue, though, in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in, G in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. That's Paul uh, reaffirming to Timothy um, as a young evangelist, uh, as he sees things get worse and worse, for him to hold fa fast in that which... Uh, he had been taught that which he had been assured of. And then, uh, you know, it goes right into chapter four. And we know that this is a letter, so it didn't have chapters. But immediately following that text, he tells him, he charges him to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort, right? With all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not put up with sound doctrine. They won't tolerate it. But heap unto themselves teachers having its and ears. In other words, they're going to just want to hear what they want to hear. And guess what? When people want to hear what they want to hear, it will always be someone who, can, who will be willing to teach it. And he's not talking to the world. He's talking to Christians. Amen, somebody. Okay? So... Going back to uh, our handout, uh, number five, again, we see that they were, they had no uh, respect for the covenant of marriage, uh, Malachi 2, uh, 13 through 16. Husbands freely divorce their wives uh, without any regard for God's commands and without any concern of the damaged lives their selfish decisions would produce. Now, we're speaking particularly about this text, about this context, and what was going on here in the day of Malachi. We understand that today that that goes both ways. Amen, somebody. Y'all act like y'all don't, don't, don't know that. This goes both ways. So it's not just husbands who do this. It's also wives who do this. All right? Okay? So, uh, and therefore, in this lesson, we will examine God's perspective because that's all that matters. God, God's perspective of marriage, its vows, while prayerfully coming to understand why God hates divorce. Okay? All right. Would someone like to read the cornerstone? Yes, sir. I just had a question and feedback on what Kim said about when she went to back to her other congregation. And, you know, you just said that um, little flock, you know, you know, people just don't love the truth no more. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure a lot of students that come on Saturday to these classes can attest that growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior is just priceless. It's a lot of stuff in God's word you just don't know and a lot of people don't want to grow. They're satisfied with their state now. 
And, and we have to grow in God's word and get better. We just didn't get baptized and get wet and say, that's it. We have to get a better understanding of God's word so that we can live a better life. That's why Jesus said, few they be that find it. Mm-hmm. Few. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not knocking if, if you're providentially hindered or you work. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who just willfully will not grow in God's word. There's no excuse. Mm-hmm. That's why he said few they be that find it. Because okay. few, few people love the truth. Few people don't want to grow. Mm. And you ask anybody that come on Saturday and you tell me, ask them, they'll tell you it's priceless. Mm-hmm. It's priceless. Absolutely. And that's why um, just as, as a whole, uh, generally speaking, all of us who are here right now, um, in about an hour, it'll be probably triple this number. Um, but do we take it upon ourselves? Do we take it upon ourselves? And that's kind of what our message is this morning. Do we take it upon ourselves to provoke one another unto love and good works as we see the day approaching? Uh, are we just, or are we just satisfied with the fact that I'm here, I'm getting what I need, let them figure it out? Or do we have enough love and compassion to try and stir our brothers and sisters up, to try and help them to come and see how beneficial it will be for those who are able to make it, okay? For those who are able, okay? We have to to continue to do our best to encourage, to support, uh, because again, the truth of the matter is um, we will be held accountable for whether or not we did our best to provoke and encourage and exhort. However, always keep in mind, you and I cannot have an appetite for someone else. Amen, somebody. You can't manufacture an appetite. That has to be organic. But we can help someone to desire to want to eat by telling them how good something is. Amen, someone. Okay? And that's where we have to be creative. All right? In, In provoking one another. All right. Okay. So, uh, Brother Yukon, can you read the cornerstone for us, please? The covenant of marriage should only be entered into after much prayer and fasting, spiritual counseling, and honest spiritual contemplation. How do y'all feel about that? And again, we know the backdrop of what we're speaking to is the marriage covenant, but I want us to always keep in mind, first and foremost, the covenant relationship we have as people of God with God. Amen, somebody. Don't lose that because we'll look at a class like this and we'll say, well, that's just for married people. And I'm here to tell you, this is not just about married people because we're married to Christ first and foremost. All of us. And that's, that's the real um, key about this entire lesson. Okay? Go ahead. Unfortunately, many couples marry without having honestly done any of these. Okay. As most are motivated to marry out of consuming passion mm-hmm. instead of content contemplative prayer. Absolutely, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. They wrongfully confuse lust with love, and soon after the wedding is over and great amounts of money has been spent on this one day. Think about all the money that's spent on one day. One day. Then you got to go back home. Amen, somebody. Then it hits you, 
All the money we have spent that could have went for a down payment on a house. We spent that on what? Hmm. I'll look this way. Okay, go ahead. Then they discovered that lust cannot and will not sustain a lasting covenant relationship which is pleasing to the Lord God. Our emotions and our will will never enable us to do what God has commanded us to do. Amen, somebody. Our own will, our own passions will never have staying power. We need it from God. In order to do what God has called us to do, we need to get what God has, what God himself provides. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Notice this. Okay. There are four types of love described to us in the scriptures. Okay. Y'all looking at this? We know agape, don't we? But do we really understand agape? All right. Agape is love of the will. It's a, a love of preference as opposed to uh, one's emotions. So agape love is not uh, brought about by our emotions. It's that which we get from God. It's how God loves, but God loves because he chooses to. He makes the decision of his own will to love, not based on someone's worthiness, but based on his goodness. That's agape. All right. But then there's love also in the scriptures that is described as storge. The word is storge. You say, well, what is that? That's familial love. That's love that we have for our family. OK, then there's philos or we know it as Philadelphia, which is friendly love that we have for close friends or fellow mankind. And then there is a thing called eros, which is erotic, sensual love. Now get this. It's the love which loves something or someone only for its value or worth and only for the desire to possess and enjoy that object or person. And that's the one that we uh, always, that, that the world uh, has now uh, replaced agape with. We get, we get married, we get into relationships not with agape, but with eros. And that's why relationships, the marriage relationship, is such in shambles today because most people fall into eros love and not agape love. Amen, somebody. Amen. All right? And therefore, agape is willfully, notice, willfully giving, self-sacrificing versus eros which is only selfish and self-seeking. Notice we always used to have that um, encouragement of in any friendship, relationship, uh, it, it, it will behoove us to take a step back and assess what do people value you for? What does your friends value you for? What does your family value you for? Who, did, who, do they, who do they truly value you for? Is it for who you are or is it for what you do? What you can give to them. Amen, somebody. Okay. So again, agape is willfully uh, giving and self-sacrificing versus eros, which is only selfish and self-seeking. Uh, notice, agape is that which is supplied and comes only from a relationship with the Lord God 
that must be added to our faith. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Someone read verses 5 through 7. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Giving all, giving all what? Giving all diligence. diligence. What does that mean? All effort, everything. To give what? Every effort. So... As was just stated a few minutes ago, it's just not about you and I just coming and being baptized and getting in that water and getting out. That's not enough as far as God is concerned. We have to begin to add something to it. Amen, somebody. All right. And we're not just we're not saying this uh, to be insensitive, uh, to beat down or anything like that, but out of exhortation, out of admonishment, you and I cannot stay the same that we were 10 years ago. That's not going to help us. That's not going to abound to us making heaven our home. We have to be growing in the likeness of Christ Jesus. Now, if I'm just still putting forth the same effort, or even less than I did 10 years ago, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Amen, somebody. Wouldn't we say that about a baby? If a baby stayed the same size for 10 years? We would say there's something wrong with that baby. Amen, somebody. And if we stay the same, there's something wrong. But the issue is many times we try to justify instead of looking into God's word and really allowing God's word to have its way with us, we try to justify our actions. I'm going to do this, and in my mind, doing this, I'm still okay with God. It's amazing what we can convince ourselves of and think that we're still okay with God. Okay? Read that one more time. And besides this. Besides this. Giving all diligence. Yes. Add to your faith. Virtue, add to your faith. Go ahead. Virtue. Mm -hmm. And to virtue knowledge. Okay. So you mean these things won't happen automatically by themselves? No. In other words, we have to put some effort. Now, how can I put effort or how can you put effort in something that we don't really give ourselves attention to? How is it going to happen? By osmosis, am I just going to add these things just by coming and sitting and being close by you and it's just going to rub off on me? Absolutely not. Read. Verse 6. And to knowledge, temperance. Mm -hmm. And to temperance, patience. Yes. And to patience, godliness. Yes. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Yes. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Okay. And to brotherly kindness, Charity or what? Love, that agape. That has to be added. That doesn't come automatically. And that's something that we struggle with in the body of Christ because we come in here, we expect for everyone, our expectation is for everyone to have agape. But everyone's not growing. Okay? Everyone's not growing. And if we're all in here and we're not growing, guess what? There won't be any agape exercised among us. And someone's feeling this is going to be hurt because without agape, we're going to continue to act like we always acted. We're still going to have the same thinking that we always had. Amen, somebody. It's going to be still, we'll be in here, but we'll still have the same worldly stinking thinking that we've always had. Yes. Is the, the word virtue, is that 
the the definition like a high moral standard? Absolutely. Is that absolutely, absolutely. And these things we have to add. Okay. They have to be added. And they they're not added by accident. Is what I really want to say. Okay, they're not added by accident. Okay, and the the motivation. The real bottom line foundational motivation to add these things is love. Mm -hmm. Okay? Love. Love for who? Love for God. All right? Because the more and more I grow in him, the more and more I see how unworthy, how, un how broken, how undone I am. And the least I can do is try to give my best. And even on my best day, I'm still not worthy. Is that all right? So these things doesn't mean that you and I are going to be sinless. Did y'all get that? Doesn't mean that we're going to be sinless. Y'all need to get this. But as we grow in him, we should be sinning less. Okay. All right. So he says in verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you and I, since we obeyed the gospel, have you and I, and this is us to ask between ourselves and God, have I been fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Have I helped someone? Have I shown the way of the gospel to someone? Have I been a light to, uh, to someone to try and guide them? Not that I, I give the increase. We know that God gives the increase. But I, have I planted? Have I watered? Have I done something? All right? Brother Rich, turn your mic off. Have I done something? Okay, all right. Let's go back. Because this is the bottom of the first page of the handout is uh, a point that we're going to leave off on today. But it's, I told you I was going in a different direction. And I'm not going in a di different direction just to be different. But I want us to really understand some things, okay? In our lesson, in our book, uh, and I understand what the author is coming from. He says that there is a third party in the marriage covenant. Y'all remember that? Well, I would like to say, in order to emphasize the point, there is not a third party in a relationship. There is a first party. Not a third party. There is a first party. Okay? There's a first party involved. Okay? So, someone read, there is a first party involved. Please. There is a first party involved. Mm. Within this section of Malachi chapter 2, starting with verse 10, is a set of verses that form one coherent thought. Okay. Per pericope. Okay. Where God rebukes and chides Judah for breaking covenant within the Israelite community as a whole. Did y'all get that? Read that one more time so that we can get that because that's critical. There is a first party involved within this, se this section of Malachi chapter 2, starting with verse 10. Starting with verse 10, <clears throat> there's what? is a set of verses that form one coherent thought. Okay, so there's some verses, starting with verse 10, that form one coherent thought. Okay? One thought. Go ahead. Pericope, where God rebukes and chides Judah for breaking covenant within the Israelite community as a whole. Breaking covenant within the Israelite community as a whole. As a whole. Okay? Go ahead. The key word in this context is 
treacherously yes. as to act treacherously towards one with whom you are in a covenant means to be unfaithful to the terms of the covenant. Okay. So and, do what we even look at that what I would what I even look at as being a member of the Church of Christ and in particular specifically being a member of this congregation would I even look at the fact that uh, however my behavior is, however I, uh, however my faithfulness is, do I even, would it even dawn on me, would it even dawn on you that that affects you? That my behavior, that your behavior will affect the community of God's people? Does that even dawn on us? Or should I come here and say, uh, yeah, I know I'm your brother in Christ. I know I'm a servant of this congregation. But however I act in my personal life, that's my business. Y'all be quiet. You can't say nothing about it. It affects you. Now, if that goes for the preacher, if that goes for the elder, if that goes for the deacon, guess what? It goes for you, too. Oh, I seen Brother Mark on Fox 8. Uh, he was beating up somebody. He was doing this. Well, guess what? What about you? And I'm not trying to minimize or excuse my behavior. We're going to be held to a higher standard. That's why he says, be not many of you teachers. People are running to be teachers whose lives are not representative of the fact that they should be teachers. Absolutely. What Murr said is just true. Well, I'm not before a class, so I don't have to hold to that standard. You're teaching somebody in your life. You and I as Christians are teaching somebody who doesn't know Christ what it means to be a Christian. And that's why you have people who will bother you sometimes and be like, shouldn't you be in church? But you're here. You kicking it at the game? Shouldn't you be in church? Or you, you're at this place? You're doing that activity? Oh, man, I thought you was a Christian. Or just are we highlighting? It's mighty quiet. I told you I was going in a different direction. Yes, ma'am. Therefore, the Judean men were being unfaithful to their marriage covenant by divorcing mm -hmm. the wives of their youth and marrying foreign women. Yes. Verse 11. Not only were they in violation of their marriage covenant, but they were also in violation of the brotherhood covenant. Yes. As their wives were a part of one people of the Lord God, just as they were. Watch this. Watch this. They had the Hold on. Oh. Hold on. I'm sorry. I, I, I couldn't collect my thought real fast. <laughs> have, we, have it ever dawned on us that in a covenant relationship of marriage, how one treats their spouse is how they treat the church? And let's even go beyond that. How we treat the church is how we treat God. So you mean to tell me that it's okay for me to come today and offer up a worship to God in a good conscience when I can't stand you and you're sitting right over there and you're my brother or my sister in Christ? Y'all help me out. Right? I'm holding iniquity in my heart against you, but I'm trying to offer worship to God. Whose image we're both made in. Yes. All that is sin, Brother Mark, and sin is what separates us from God. So 
whether you can't stand somebody or something like that, and, and you're holding grudges, that's sinful in the sight of God. So it's just whatever sin that harbors in our heart is a separation to God. Okay. All right. So again, uh, we understand that they were divorcing. They were uh, breaking a covenant with their brothers, with their sisters in this context, with those men who divorced their wives. Those were their sisters. Before my wife is my wife, she's first my sister. And even before she's my sister, she's God's daughter. Even before I'm her husband, I'm her brother. I'm God's son. I'm a child of God. And I think if our perspective was more like this, we would fuss and fight far less in the congregation, in the body of Christ, the church of Christ. Okay? We have or they had the same one father and creator. Verse 10. And likewise today, as we close, a marriage between two Christians who are both in a covenant with God is not just between two parties. There is a first party. And this first party is the Lord God. Now, what does this mean? Notice, marriage is a covenant relationship first and foremost with the Lord God. Amen, somebody? To be unfaithful in one marriage, one's marriage vows, first and foremost, is to be unfaithful to the Lord God himself. Is that all right? Okay. So, Unlawful divorce, and we're speaking in terms of where we are today, all right? We'll leave on this point. Unlawful divorce, which means that which is not permitted by God in accordance to his word and his truth, is an affront. It's an offense that causes outrage to the Lord God. And in addition, when Christians divorce or violate their marriage or their covenant relationship with one another, they do so against their own sister or brother in Christ. We have some uh, passages there that we'll, get, we'll cover when we come back on next week. But what I'm really trying to get us to see is, uh, first and foremost, our covenant relationship is with God. It's with God. And when we fail to look at it that way, then it's easier for us to not hold to the vows of the covenant because I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. And any day of the week, I can look at you or you can look at me and say, well, you ain't worthy for me to hold this covenant relationship. But when I'm looking at God, who can say God is not worthy? So when we're looking at this relationship, it's important because guess what? We have people who divorce. Amen. Somebody, they go downtown and get some papers. But guess what? As we'll see when we come back, it doesn't matter what you get downtown. If you're not lawfully divorced and according to the scriptures, you're still married in the sight of God. You can think you free all you want to, but you're still married in the sight of God. And that bodes true first and foremost for us as Christians. We can leave the body all we want to. We can go to another uh, so-called man-made religious thing, all right? But we're still Christians. We can never be unchristianed. We can be Christians in error. We're just unfaithful. And many have erred from the truth. But guess what, y'all? They're still Christians. They've just erred from the truth. 
they're unfaithful. And we have to pray. We have to help them before it's everlasting too late. And there's some of everything. We have family members who have been affronted or, or affected by certain things, who have laughed or who have left for whatever reasons. And, and I'm here to tell you this, and I'm not trying to be insensitive. There's no good reason to leave God. You can say, well, you know, I went to that church and that church did this. Well, what did God do to you other than love you? And that's the issue. We're more concerned with a relationship with the church than the head of it. We'll stop right there. Brother Mike, can you pray for us? Uh, dearly Father, we come to you this morning. We're grateful that uh, you have brought each and every